kind of is. I would like to argue that, yes, we do have free will, but it's not what uh, we might think of it. It's not um, arranged in quite the way that, that uh, people, at least in the West, have thought about it in the last couple of thousand years or so. Um, and so, of course, the considerations for that are several. Um, right, um, on the one hand, there's no reason to think that our brains operate any differently to uh, any other chemicals or um, physical thing around us. Your brain is a physical thing, so it probably operates according to physical laws, right? And your thoughts are governed by uh, the laws of physics and chemistry, etc. Um, and so you might think, well, if that's true, can I really be free? Um, on the other hand, you really feel like you're free. You feel like uh, when you make a decision, it's you making it, and you, you can choose between two things. And uh, I actually don't think there's any contradiction there. I would contend that you are free to do as you wish. You can choose between options, uh, even though um, in the end, the choice you make was determined um, by uh, external circumstances around you. Um, so this uh, presentation really focuses on a particular, particular paper written by a cognitive neuroscientist by the name of Wigner, and he uh, was looking at conscious will, I believe this is from 2003, so current-ish, um, but anyway, uh, he started off with a quote from Hume, which I thought was good, and Hume said, will is the internal impression we feel and are conscious of when we knowingly give rise to any new motion in our body. And so he's trying to define, he's trying to define will, um, uh, not necessarily free will, because that's the big debate, right? Is it free or not? So we're just talking about will. Um, and uh, we, when we think about free will, we kind of maybe sometimes conflate it with awareness, and we say, well, there's this big thing of consciousness and um, awareness, free will, uh, sometimes you put them all in a big bubble and you say, okay, well, that, that, that's that debate. Do we have free will and conscious awareness? Or, or maybe, uh, I guess we know we have these things, the debate is over this, but we kind of conflate them. And um, in cognitive psychology, um, it's often uh, separated out, and we want to study these things uh, separately and see if, uh, what we can figure out about each of them. And perhaps they're related, perhaps. Uh, perhaps they're no more related than any part of your brain is, is, is related. Um, so, Hume said, well, it's been a eternal impression we feel it. It's, 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 he said, um, this, is, this is the feeling that you get when you're actually trying to make a decision, when you're actually trying to go and do something, um, rather than maybe conscious awareness. This is, this is a, well, it's a feeling that you get when you, when you decide to um, consciously decide to stand up and go to RSS or stand up and walk out of the room because you're bored or whatever else. Um, this was the example that Wigner gave. And he said, will is the personal feeling of causation. And he talks about uh, someone who goes and has a shower and maybe often in the morning uh, you might actually go and have a shower and you might not be aware of of what you're doing at all. Usually you're half, half asleep still. And although it's, you could say at one level you're conscious, you're not asleep, um, you don't necessarily think consciously, I'm going to go and have a shower now. It's just uh, kind of an automatic thing. You're on autopilot. And um, in this definition of will, uh, there is no active will here. The, you're just kind of doing it because it's habit. Um, an act of will is when you actually uh, decide, okay, I'm going to do this. Consciously willing in action requires a feeling of doing, a kind of internal will that somehow certifies authentically that one has done the action. If a person did not get a feeling, that kind of feeling about a shower, even if we planned it with her to investigate, there is no way we could establish for sure whether she consciously willed her showering. And I thought that was a rather awkward way of putting it. But that was straight from him, so <laughs> like, I'm just the messenger. Um, Alien hand syndrome is another thing that, that is studied in relation to this. It's a good example of a kind of um, thing, people, actions that people do. So 
some people can uh, have uh, this syndrome usually as a result of a traumatic brain injury where um, they find a hand is moving completely independently of their will to, to tell them what to do as far as they're aware. So uh, one guy was uh, talking about how he would play chess and he would uh, make a move and he would move his, move his rock up and, and then his left hand would, would, would move it back and take the pawn up and move that. And he was like, what's going on here? And so he'd, he'd move it back with his right hand doing the move he wanted and his left hand would again like correct it. Here's this big fight between his left and his right. He was only conscious though of what was going on with his right hand. Um, so that was that's interesting. It's usually uh, split brain patients where people uh, have had to have their brain cut in two basically and you get all kinds of weird effects like that. But it is an example of where somebody's doing an action which isn't conscious. Um, and we can study these things uh, all of these things where, where people do things that aren't conscious and uh, then we can work out, well hang on, what's, what's going on here, what's missing here? And if we can work out what's missing here, maybe we can work out what we normally rely on to be conscious of our actions and be conscious of our decisions. Because it, it's interesting to note, this guy was completely aware that he was moving. He just wasn't wearing, uh, aware of deciding to do it, of willing to do it. That's what we're talking about here. Another woman tied up her arm at night to keep from picking at her clothes, uh, grasping at her neck, and uh, other like potentially dangerous things. Um, and so this is the thing that we're talking about. Um, there's a feeling of doing, feeling of not, uh, and, and, and then there's a feeling of not doing, and then there's, there's, there's on the other axis, there's doing and, and not doing. So this is, this is normal, this is, um, uh, our friend in the shower, or our person with the alien hand syndrome. Um, over here is interesting. This is where people feel like they're uh, doing something, having an effect on something that they're seeing, but there's actually no effect there. Um, the illusion of control. So one common example of this is uh, you're watching a sports game. Um, it's RSS. I don't know if you're doing that, but um, <laughs> you're watching a sports game, and uh, it's 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 twenty all and. Uh, 78 minute and you're thinking oh like what's going to happen here and you don't want to say look I reckon they're going to take it out because you're afraid you drink to your own tea and that's the kind of thing you have this feeling that it's there's something that you can say and it can have an effect on what's going to happen over at the stadium um, being broadcast to you by a satellite um, gamblers have the same thing that they oh, to throw this dice in a particular way and I'm going to get a result just that that winning six that I need. Um, and what's the other example? Yes, the 19th century. Um, there were, it was, it was a big craze in, in uh, London, actually, in the 19th century, um, where uh, I guess a lot of people were getting away from traditional religion and they were kind of wanting to be a bit experimental and try a few things out. So they'd have seances, basically, um, and they'd sit down around a table and they'd do some chanting and stuff getting into the mood and um, when they do this they find that the table would, would rise up and and float and it would kind of uh, they would all be sitting like this under the table and they notice that their hands would be shaking along with this table the table's actually kind of moving their hands so michael faraday uh, who of course was a very uh, prominent inventor of the time decided to investigate this empirically he uh put some kind of um touch sensors, I don't know what kind of touch sensors they had back then, but he got touch sensors, put them in between people's hands and the tables that they were using, and uh, he found, well, their hands are just moving the table. Um, and people, they, they all thought that, that they were completely passive in this, um, and they were getting all excited because they thought the spirits were moving the table or something. And there's another illusion of control. Um, but the really confusing thing about what Wigner idea, his theory here on will is that um, actually even when you feel like you are consciously controlling something, you're not. And this is where a lot of people got really confused about this because uh, um, in the journal article, this particular journal, um, 
he always publishes uh, replies from other scientists after. And they were saying all sorts of nasty things. Uh, and okay, there are only one or two who I thought were really extreme. But um, a lot of people were confused. They're saying, like, you're saying we have no control over our actions anymore, that we're kind of just doomed to, to do what, um, what our unconscious is telling us to do with no control of the matter. And then they said, well, what do we do about criminals? Like, do we, can we never convict them because they're just doing what their unconscious is telling them to do? Um, and Rebecca was kind of saying that. He was saying, um, you know what, um, by the time you've thought of something, by the time you consciously make a willing decision to do something, you've actually already done it, right? Um, and a lot of people had that idea that this is, this is really completely threatening on the idea of free will. Um, remember the technical definition of will that he's talking about. Um, it's this feeling, active decision. It's not something that you have when you've got any hand syndrome and moving your hand. It's not even something that you have when you're just on autopilot in the morning when you get out of bed. It's uh, a decision that you make. Okay, well, I'm going to do this. It's a very active thing. And um, uh, all, these, all this will is, is is a conscious thought to go and do something over and above the awareness of your actions that you'd have at any point in time about most things that you do. Yeah. Um, so, free will and determinism, um, this is a bit of a sidetrack. Um, might actually spend the last 10 minutes talking about this just about because it's an important issue, I think, um, maybe one that you're more familiar with the debate on. Um, are we free or are we kind of determined by our environments to do stuff? And I say both. I think that's a very, very minority position. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, I'd like to think that it's got more support by cognitive scientists, and though again, I don't know. Um, but uh, as you've seen from Wigner's approach, he's looking at will in a very kind of a technical way, and it's not necessarily an all or nothing thing when you get down to that level. Um, but what he says what isn't the case is that, uh, as is imagined, you know, back in the Enlightenment and before that period, it's not the case that you have some kind of little box in your head, a free willer that makes the decisions. And that's what a lot of people might imagine. That, um, that there's a box that kind of roughly corresponds to your spirit or soul, and that, that connects, makes the actual decisions for you. So you have all your inputs in your head, from your eyes, your ears, whatever, uh, your beliefs going in to this thing. And then you, that's you in there, you're making that decision to stand up and walk out or 